This week we'll be moving further into spatial analysis, especially vector analysis. Um, so to start, buffering is probably the simplest um, tool that is commonly used for vector data. And the idea here is that it simply puts a buffer around spatial data. So um, here's an example where we show if you take this data set, which has some points, maybe a stream that's polylines, and then some buildings that are polygons. If you buffered around that, like say you wanted to see if we could harvest these trees, see if they were within 30 meters of the stream, um, or see if you had a fire clearance from these buildings that was a certain distance uh, to the trees, then you could go ahead and do a buffer. Here we have buffered around the trees. Now, um, in ArcGIS, it buffers each individual feature, so you end up with these overlapping buffers. So quite often what we'll do is we will then dissolve the features together, and this is what the actual layer of the trees buffered and then dissolved together um, create. Same idea here with the streams. When you buffer polylines, it does each individual uh, polyline um, effectively reach uh, independently. So you end up with this is actually the, the resulting polygon, and then you can dissolve them together and end up with this layer. Uh, again, buildings, same idea. There's your buffer. We tend to dissolve them, and then there's your final layer. And buffers, buffering is used very commonly in natural resource GIS. Uh, to create these types of layers and then do further analysis. All right, then there's a whole group of vector operations that we call overlay operations. And the reason we call them overlay is because we tend to take one layer, like here I've got annual precipitation, and take another layer, annual temperature, and you overlay them together, like here I've done an intersection operation, and now you've got a new layer that has, well, here's where it's 20 millimeters per year precipitation and 60 degrees centigrade. 20 mils per year here, milliliters, um, seven degrees centigrade. And so it ends up overlaying these and combining different layers together. There's different ways of doing this. Uh, intersection, and if we go back all the way to uh, geometry when we took that in grammar school, intersection is where you take two shapes and then you find the area that is common to those two shapes represented here in red. So here's the first shape, second shape, and then the intersection. So in GIS, it's a little bit more complicated, okay, because what you've got is you've got two layers. Each layer can have features in it. So there's layer one with two features, layer two with two features. When you do an intersection in GIS, um, you're gonna end up with four features, and then you're gonna end up with the attributes from both layers that over, for those features that overlap with features in the original layers. In other words, here we've got uh, attributes from layer one and layer two in the area that intersects these two features. So it's feature by feature, and then it accumulates the attributes from both layers. Now clip is another type of intersection. Okay, it intersects two layers, but when it does, it only keeps the attributes from the first layer. And we've used clip quite a bit to ju just what it says. We clip one layer with another one, but typically the one that we're clipping with, the one I refer to as being the scissors, that's cutting the other one, right? So we're using this one to cut out this layer. Um, that one we only care about using it to clip. We don't care about its, its attributes typically. Okay, um, union, things get a little more complicated. I'm using the term union here. Uh, again, back into grammar school, when you take two objects and you union them, to, union them together, you get the combination of both of those objects. Instead of each one, you get the area uh, where either one of those objects appears, in this case, features in GIS. Um, now, when you do a union in ArcGIS, it actually does something different from this. It combines two layers together, but notice it keeps both layers. So it's kind of a union, although I, I don't like that they use that term, okay, because from geometry that has a very specific meaning to it. It's really just combining these two layers together and then it finds all the unique combinations of features where they overlap. So like here's the parts from the intersect where it's combined these together. Okay, it's found the unique intersection between these two and then combine the attributes from both. Here we just have this one layer and it only has attributes from that layer. Now it will actually have columns 
um, will will be there for all the features, but the attributes will be blank or null for these uh, this layer where the feature two attributes are. Better to show that inside of a GIS application. Um, now, the, the one that I think of as being a union is actually called Dissolve in Arc. So you need to know these names. These names are really important because of how you find the right tool. And that's where you take one layer that's got multiple features and it dissolves the boundary between the features. And you can do this uh, for the whole file. Um, I, you know, you can take a parcel file for Humboldt County, union them all, to, or sorry, dissolve them all together and you get the county boundary. Um, or you can do specific ones, like you can combine forest areas together or urban areas together, so you can do it based on attributes. So it's a pretty powerful tool. Now race is like clip, only it does the opposite. It takes a layer and uses it to cut out the part. Rather than clipping around it and keeping the part, it removes this part. We use this once in a while. Now there's actually a whole bunch of these. These are the ones I use most of the time that I see used a lot. All right, and I built this little tool of buffering just so you could get a feel for it. One of the things that folks miss is no matter what the original input type is, if it's a point, polyline, or a polygon, the result of buffering is going to be a polygon. Okay, and then if you do a polygon, or sorry, a buffer and then dissolve, you get what I've got here on the right where they will all merge together into big blobs, but that's okay, because usually when we use buffer, we're looking to say we want to buffer around something to see how far it is from other things or what things are within that distance. Um, and then we can do an intersect to find out what those are, or clip. Okay, um, again, here's a little uh, interactive tool that I built. You've got union, intersection, XOR activity. Uh, sorry, XOR. Um, so here's our original. Union, now remember in arc, this is called dissolve. So you gotta remember that. Intersection is gonna be the combination of the two. And XOR, which we don't use a whole lot once in a while, is actually gonna find the area that is only in one of the two features. Okay, so that's a little different. Um, okay, um, more overlay operations. Um, now, where would you use intersection? So, really common place for this to be used is habitat suitability. Let's say that you've got a fungus that likes conifer forests and annual precipitation greater than 50 inches. And notice I used um, the term and there. And is very important. And says it needs to be an area that is in this feature and in this feature. And we use and and or later. In fact, they show up over and over again uh, with computers. So that's where you would use intersection. This would find where there is conifer forest and annual precipitation over 50 inches. Union is different in that it finds the area that is in one feature or in the other feature. Okay, so this might be where you wanna find where is it conifer forest or deciduous forest. Different example. Um, Dissolve, again, we use a lot uh, to combine things together, especially if we have a shapefile like this where there's all these different regions and we want to put them together based on a particular attribute type and then you dissolve them together and you get something like this. Um, we are going to use this this week in working with uh, Arcata Forest data. So here's where you might clip the streams, uh, clip clip the trails to a stream's buffer. In other words, you want to find out where are the trails within a certain distance from a stream. So you would go ahead and buffer the streams and then clip the trails. Um, a race, you might want to say, well, here's where our farm is in layer one, and then we want to race the area around streams so that we can find a buffer distance to uh, keep our cattle from uh, grazing and waiting in a stream nearby, so we can control that. Uh, here's some other ones. Split, I don't use these as often. Um, I should have mentioned this earlier. One of the things about these drawings is these were actually created in ArcGIS. So if you have any um, concerns or confusion about uh, what they do, these diagrams um, were actually done with these tools. Now, the help is pretty good. I've only found like one error as far as the diagrams and the help goes. 
but these I created directly, actually created this as a, a layer, these two layers, ran them through ArcGIS, and created these slides from it. Um, all right. Okay, um, and again, these are ones that I don't see used very often. Um, append and merge. Merge is one I do use a lot, and that's when I have two layers and I want to merge them together into a new layer. So that is one that I use quite a bit. And I used to get union and merge confused a lot because it seemed like they were doing similar things. Union, merge, and dissolve. Uh, you need to remember what those do. <laughs> okay. Uh, merge combines multiple vector layers together in a new layer doesn't actually do anything spatially to them, just combines them together. Uh, so that's handy as well. All right, there are issues when you do this. Um, one of the big ones is data sets that are slightly different. In other words, this is a country outline for Canada up here, one of their provinces, and this is from the United States of America. And not surprisingly, if you take the Canadian outline for their provinces and the US outline for our states, you find out they do not exactly match. In fact, there's actually still areas that are, that are being um, argued about <laughs> between Canada and the U.S. hundreds of years later. And we refer to this as a sliver, where you have two areas overlapping, and so you end up with this sliver area that's extra uh, in dispute between the two, probably. And then you have a gap, which is another one, um, to say, well, there's this open area. And of course, these shouldn't exist. There's no actual gap between Canada and the U.S. It should be one line, actually, one, one polygon line here. So sliver and gap, those are important terms in GIS for that. Um, now, when you do that, uh, you can set tolerances, and that will seal some of those slivers if they're below the tolerance. Um, if you're doing anything that could have political ramifications, you actually probably want to go through and do it manually. Um, you can also dissolve them away with a tolerance, okay? And then there is an eliminate tool that will manage this if you have very large numbers of slivers and gaps. Okay, um, something we use a lot with attributes is structured query language. Um, I should say we used to use it a lot because ArcMap, uh, we needed to use it for the select by attribute tool. ArcGIS Pro now has the little tool I've showed you that makes it a little bit easier. You don't have to actually learn SQL, okay? And SQL stands for Structured Query Language. It is a database language. It's a huge language. ArcMap just implements a portion of it, um, specifically the WHERE clause from a SELECT statement. And that's what this is. SELECT star from table name WHERE, and then you can have a WHERE clause. So this is the part you don't see in ArcGIS that if you took a database class, which I do recommend, databases are used heavily in GIS work, um, not all the time, but especially with larger projects. I select star from table name where this is true. So an example would be if we had the natural earth countries layer, we wanted to say, well, where are the countries that have the United Kingdom as their sovereignty? Uh, you would say just sovereignty equals United Kingdom. And SQL is used pretty heavily in the GIS world. Uh, for selecting attributes, raster calculator, and working with geodatabases. So those are the, the three that I see all the time. Um, okay, so there's a number of comparisons, equals, greater than, less than, greater than, equal to, less than, or equal to, not equals. Notice that's a less than and a greater than combined, which is a little different. And then like is for comparing strings, and typically it's case independent. Now this varies with the software you're working with. Um, sometimes you need to put percents around it to get that to work, uh, but strings are a little different and there's some differences depending on the software you're in. Um, these are just some examples where you could say, I want to say FID equals one. I just want to get that specific feature that has that value. Um, area less than 10,000, I want to get all the features where the area is less than 10,000, as opposed to less than or equal to 10,000. And that's important to keep clear because you really want to make sure you use the equals when you want to and not when you don't. Um, now looking for names is a bit of a challenge because you could say name equals crater lake, but that'll only get the ones that exactly match this text. If there's a space at the end, if its capitalization is different, it will not match. And that's where light comes in. Okay, 
Uh, note that typically in GS packages, the fields over here are in double quotes, and the string values or text values are going to have single quotes. And if you start typing SQL statements, that's one of the problems you can get into. Um, okay, and here's a note about how to get past the case issues in ArcGIS. And again, that'll vary depending upon the software you're using. One of the important things we just haven't have already um, touched on is something that is inherent in all digital computers. It's actually part of the basis of how they work, and they're called Boolean values. Um, capitalized because it's named after uh, Boolean, the fellow who created them, or I guess invented them. Um, and the idea is that you have these values that can only be true or false. Uh, it can only be a zero or a one. A one means true, and you'll also see T being used. A zero means false, and you'll also see F being used for that. Okay? And again, this is what computers do. In fact, computers are just a bunch of switches. That's what your computer memory is. A lot of switches. If you have four gig of RAM in your computer, four gigabytes, there's eight um, switches in each byte. So four times eight is 24. That means you have 24 billion little switches inside your computer. So it's a lot of switches, but each switch is very simple. It's a zero or one. And that's how computer memory works. And actually that's how pretty much everything in a computer works with zeros and ones. Um, one of the cool things is we can take and combine those together with and, or, and not. I'm not going to talk a lot about not because we don't use it very often, but we use and and or a lot. In fact, and the spatial equivalent of that is an intersection. The spatial equivalent of or is a union. And here's the piece that's important is if you have something that is true and you and them together, sorry, if you have a value that's true and another value that's true and you and them together, you get true. If you do anything else, you get false. If you or them together and they're both true, you get true. But if either of them are true, you will actually also get true. You only get false when they are both false. So and A and B must be true to get a true value. With or, A or B need to be true to get a true value. Yeah, A or B. The only time you get false is when they're both false. Um, this is really important and we use this all the time to combine together our queries. And you've actually already been using this probably when you search on the web without really realizing it because it's behind the scenes. So let's say we wanted to get areas where uh, features where the area was greater than 10,000 and uh, improvement was equal to zero. So now we're going to get both of these. If we wanted to find islands in Hawaii where the name was like Hawaii and or areas in Hawaii and the area is less than 10,000 we combine them together with an and. We could find ponderosa pines at a dbh of greater than one by going species like ponderosa and dbh greater than one. For or, you could use rainfall less than 20 or slope is greater than 35 to find, say, a landside risk. Okay, heavy rainfall or very steep slopes. Um, and you can use not. Uh, we tend to use just state name equals Colorado, and then we switch the selection. That's what we tend to do in GIS. But you could always do not um, to find the states that are not named Colorado. Okay. Um, now, note that A and B or C is not the same as A and B or C. Okay. Now, because of this, I tend to do these one at a time, and I'm pretty careful with them. I try to not combine them too much together, which you'll hear repeatedly with me with GIS, is best case is to do things step by step. In other words, if you're doing this attribute, you could actually create a column for the result of A and B, and a third column for the result of A and B, and orient that with C. So that way you can see each column of what's happening with your selection. And that's it.